that we, we have a dialogue to make sure that the right things are done for the patients and to make sure we are behaving in a proper way. As far as being able to comment as to whether um, on specific emails, no, sir, I can't comment on those. Help, help me understand, for the record, moving forward, Johnson & Johnson's commitment on what is the proper way. Johnson & Johnson's commitment on what is the proper way yeah. to continue to dialogue with the FDA to, and to ensure that we are looking out for the rights of, for the best interest of patients. Sir, if I, if I could elaborate for a little bit, uh, you know, I think that we try and establish ourselves. I think there is a reference that the Chairman made earlier on to our credo, and our credo, our first responsibility is to the people that use our products. I stated, and I would state again, that we let them down. There is absolutely no doubt we let them down. This was not one of our best moments. We are going to improve it, and we are going to fix it and improve upon it. And we are stressing, as I said also, I have gone out to our facilities, I have talked to our people, and I have talked to our leadership to ensure that we continue to reinforce the responsibility we have to the people who use our products. There is absolutely nothing more important than ensuring the safety of our products and the quality of our products. So going forward, we are committed to doing the right thing for patients. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the committee has documents that uh, demonstrate uh, that on September 18, 2009, um, there was a letter to health care professionals, like physicians, explaining the recall of children's and infants' Tylenol. Uh, on the third line of the second paragraph of this particular document, BCPACIA is clearly mentioned. It mentions that children with underlying pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, or compromised immune systems are at high risk. Uh, then uh, there was an, another document dated September 24, 2009, just six days later describes the recall of children's and infants Tylenols from Tylenol.com. It is directed at the public, but there was no mention of obesopation, no mention of any conditions uh, a child might have, like cystic fibrosis, uh, that would make them more vulnerable. Now, this would make sense if a patient had to go to their doctor to get the medicine, but because the doctor uh, would have a chance to convey the hazard to the patient, but this was an over-the-counter drug. Now, uh, and, and apparently they kept the public out of the, out of the loop. So follow this pattern. We have got uh, McNeil knowing a product was defective. They kept it uh, away from public knowledge. Uh, they hired phantom contractors who uh, purchased the product but did not inform store personnel. As a matter of fact, their contractors were told, don't tell the store personnel. Inform the doctors, don't inform the public. Mr. Chairman, what we have here, I think, is a pattern of concealment. Now, one of the things I am concerned about, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Weldon, uh, your, your testimony and presentation has all the earmarks of coaching from these, uh, uh, these spin doctors who uh, help corporate executives put a good face on misconduct, uh, to say, okay, admit, you know, throw yourself in a mercy on the court, we did wrong. But wait a minute, there is a pattern of concealment here. You can't call that pattern a mistake. A person can make a mistake once, but if you keep making the quote mistake unquote over and over and over, then somebody has to ask, well, it's just the way you do business or the way you did business. Now, Ms. Goggins, I was present at your testimony the last time, and there is a transcript of your testimony, and I listened carefully when you said at the time of the hearing uh, that you weren't aware of any retrieval actions. Um, now, I have here a memo which the Chairman alluded to uh, at, in his opening statement, uh, which um, is from Gary, uh, is to Gary Benedict uh, from um, Bob Miller. And, and listen to this memo. Uh, Gary, as you know, we have negotiated an agreement with the FDA not to formally conduct a recall for Motrin's AIDS, but rather conduct the, quote, soft market withdrawal, unquote. This was a major win for us as it limits the press that will be seen. We had committed to FDA to complete this withdrawal by July 15th. There have been continuing issues trying to get a per PO, purchase order, from the marketing group, which is now putting our ability to meet the July 15th time frame in jeopardy. 
At the same time as we delay this work, the cost to complete the work continues to increase because of the fact that the outside resource, that is the people involved in this recall, in, in the phantom recallers, will now need more resources to expedite the work. We cannot extend our commitment date to FDA. It is now estimated this will cost approximately $400,000 which is approximately two times what was in initially originally quoted. And then uh, Peter Luther uh, has an answer here. He said, group, where is the miss here? Given our current financial situation, I hope we're not going to really double our costs to do this. Let's make this happen ASAP. Now, Ms. Goggins, since you're the head of this consumer uh, group, are, are you trying to lead this committee to believe that you knew nothing about it, that apparently from this memo, there was widespread discussion within your organization about uh, a, a phantom recall, about the cost of the recall, about not being able to get cooperation from the marketing people. You, you're at the top of, of this uh, group, and you knew nothing about it? Really? Do, do you want to... I'm not talking about what's on the record here. Are you, are you saying that no one ever talked to you about it? You, not only do you have no recollection, no one talked to you. You're sure that no one talked to you about it. Please help us. Yes, I will. Um, thank you for the opportunity. As I said in my opening testimony... No, I, no, answer my question, not your opening testimony. What's the answer to my question? I did not know at the time that I testified in May. I have since learned from looking at documents that there was a retrieval going on. I did not know that at the time of my testimony in May, I don't believe. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I have to tell you, this, this, is, this testimony is lacking in credibility in light of, in light of this, uh, this particular uh, document. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentleman lady from Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Norton. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a question about children's medicine. Um, um, we have a McNeil document that shows that a contaminant was discovered in April uh, 2008. Um, and another document that shows that um, more than 8 million bottles had been shipped uh, starting in March. 2008. So w when you put these two documents together, doesn't this mean that although your company recalled uh, 8 million bottles of the children's medicine in 2009, uh, that the fact is that you, you had discovered the problem at least a year earlier in 2008? May I comment on that? Yes, Mr. Weldon, this is a question for you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to maybe clarify the record um, as in terms of what exactly took place. Um, and we're talking about the besipation, the potential bacterial contamination of the product. Uh, just to maybe shed a little light on it, the way we manufacture our product is we order product from, you know, we order, let's say, raw materials or from suppliers. We then test those raw materials, we manufacture product, we test the product, and then we release the product. What happened in this case is we had done that, and in a batch of raw materials that came from a supplier, we detected besipatia. We eliminated that from our manufacturer, and we want to be clear that none of that was used in any product that was manufactured or left our facility. We went back and checked besipatia, we went back and checked the product. We wanted to make sure there was no risk, as we saw, to any, anybody that was there, anybody that would consume this product. The following year, in, I think you said in, in 2009, the FDA came to inspect our facility, and they found exactly what we had done. And they said there could be a risk that there is besipatia in the product that, in the product that was delivered, that was uh, gone out. We had never used, I want to be clear, we had never used the raw materials that had besipatia. We felt confident in the work we had done that there was no besipatia in the products that we released. But you believe that in, in, in 2008 that those eight plus yep. million bottles that had been shipped starting in 2009, which your own document says get uh, consumed very quickly, That's uh, that 
that you you believe that um, none of this contaminant made its way into those eight million bottles. That's correct, because the raw material that had bisopatia we did not use to manufacture any product. We eliminated that. The FDA's position, and in discussion we said fine, was that possibly there could have been in some product. So we recalled the product. Um, but we, we were confident in the manufacturing process, the checks that we used, and then we have a thing called retained samples where we take these and put them aside of the products that are manufactured. We went and checked that after we brought product back. We went and checked those retained samples, and there was no trace of bisopatia. But to protect patients and as a precautionary measure, and I think we also mentioned this in the communications that went out to the, um, to the customers that we had, we said that there was a, a product there that, had, that we did not know had any problems. We had worked closely with the FDA on this to take the product off the market, and we have no today, we still have no, we do not feel and we have no indication that any product that was ever shipped had bisopatia. But because of the, lot, the product we did not use, the raw material, there, there was a concern there could have been a potential risk. So we accepted that and withdrew the product. But we have never confirmed that there was any bisopatia in any of the products we released, and it was not, never used, I, I'm stressing, the raw material that had bisopatia in it was never used to manufacture a product that was shipped out of the facility. In any of those 8 million? In any of those 8 million, okay. yes, ma'am. Mr. Weldon, let me ask you another uh, question. Uh, is it not true that 8, uh, that eight count vials of Moltron uh, tablets uh, uh, can no longer be found on, on, sh 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 on your store shelves um, because you no longer make them? That is correct. To the best of my knowledge, that is correct. But isn't it commonly known that a Moltron tablets were removed from store shelves because the product was defective? Yes, ma'am. Once, once again, um, to clarify, there was, we, we identified there was never a health risk to patients. Um, what we found is that this product dissolved more slowly than we would have liked it to have dissolved and it was supposed to have dissolved, so we went out and took the products off the shelf. That is correct. Well, I wonder if you could explain this guidance. Um, given to Johnson and uh, we have another document here, given to Johnson and Johnson and, and to McNeil employees uh, in an internal uh, email to tell customers that the product is not on the shelves because your company no longer makes it. Here, 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 here's the, here's the uh, email. Um, isn't the recall and the consumer will not know that we recalled it, our candid response to the customers is that we no longer make the eight count vial? Yes, I'm, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that specific document. I'm not sure if it refers to. It was referring to notifying our own internal employees that we no longer made it. It, it, it tells your employees what what to tell the customers. Mm -hmm. And and that is correct. We we no longer. Uh, again, I I don't see the document. I don't know, but we no longer make that product. That's absolutely correct. Uh, you do have the document before you, though. I understand. Uh, the document says, unfortunately, the consumer Q&A form doesn't apply to the Moltron products since it isn't a recall and the consumer will not know that we recalled it. Um, it's only two lots of the product, you say. They simply won't be able to find it on the shelf. They will not know we recalled it. They simply will not know we, they, they are not able to find it on the shelf. Our candid response to the consumers is that we no longer make the eight count file. Could, could I take a moment and just read this to? Please. On that note, I give the gentlewoman additional time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought he had the document and looked at it. I did. I just wasn't aware of it. I apologize. 
Yeah, I, 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 it says it, it refers to a, a consumer Q and A that I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of, but. It does say that the response to the consumer is that we no longer make the eight count vial. Oh, is that the is is, is that that is, that is correct? We no longer make it now. I, I all the is that is 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 that the response um, under all the circumstances that should have been made? No recall. We just don't make it. No, ma'am. I, I think um, that there there are some lessons that we've learned, and I think that you all have helped us with this. I think some of the the wording that we have used and the directions we have given have been inappropriate. I cannot comment on this specifically, but I can assure you that we would be much more transparent with our customers and the people that would have our products yeah. in the future. And I think it's You understand that th there is a difference uh, between telling a consumer you no longer make a product, which may simply mean you decided to move on to another product, and telling the consumer that the product has been recalled so that the the consumer may know to, to look himself or herself for the product and all that goes along with recalled products. Yes, ma'am, and, I, I, and I, do, I do appreciate your comments. I, I do think in, in May we, we did send out an announcement um, saying that we were going to be taking these products off the shelves, but I think your point is well taken. Thank you. Gentlewoman, time has expired. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Goggins and uh, Mr. Weldon, for being here. Um, there were, were repeated instances of alarming problems with Johnson & Johnson's children's medicine from 2008 to 2010. And uh, in April 2008, McNeil began receiving reports that an uncharacteristic odor in, in its products was causing nausea, stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, FDA found that McNeil's initial investigation into these complaints was unjustifiably delayed and terminated prematurely. Over 100 additional complaints later, McNeil did not discover the root cause of the contamination until September 2009. Uh, why did it take so long to figure out the cause of the contamination? Uh, yes, sir. I, I, um, the, this, this was an area where we have, have learned uh, a very important lesson. And as you said, in 2008 there were adverse events reported that we knew and it had to deal with the um, aroma in the, in the product and then some reported cases of nausea and vomiting. We investigated that to see if there was a microbial content or any content in the product. We found that there was not, and we saw that the adverse events fell, fell off. So we knew that there was, uh, at that point, we identified that there would be no harm to patients. There was some gastric distress, but no serious adverse events. The, the adverse events fell off. They came back at, in, uh, in September, I guess in 2009. I'm not sure exactly the, the date. Uh, we then investigated it and I think worked closely with the FDA to identify. And, it, and I have to say it was a very complex issue to identify a product called TBA. And what had happened is this is a preservative, there is a preservative put on wooden pallets that can migrate into packaging material. Um, it was something that has been very hard to identify and determine. Now, I also want to be clear. We should have determined the root cause in 2008. I do not want to defend our inaction there. And I think the FDA pointed that out correctly to us, and we appreciate that. What we did do, though, in working closely with the FDA, was able to identify this. And it was a very, very difficult initiative that needed to be undertaken, and we were able to determine it. And I think, as the FDA has said, this actually helped to lead to some new guidance documents from the FDA for everybody to benefit by. Mm -hmm. So I do not want to make any excuses for what we should have done in 2008, which was to have determined the root cause. As a corporation, we know today if we have adverse events we need to investigate, we investigate them thoroughly until we determine the root cause. Um, and that is exactly what happened in this instance. We did not, and the FDA was absolutely correct in pointing that out to us. And we did identify it ultimately. It was very, very. It was a very scientifically challenging exercise, um, but that's no excuse. We did ultimately determine it, and I think in combination with the FDA, I think it's something and, that will benefit and, many people. But, but Mr. Weldon, it, it uh, leached through the the. Uh, um, yes, that's correct. What happens is 
Um, they put a preservative on a wooden pallet, which mm -hmm. materials are shipped on. And the preservative can actually break down and actually, as you this words you described are very accurate, leach into the packaging material. And that packaging material then, when you put the product in it and you ship the product out, right. can actually cause this um, okay. uh, musty odor, sure. odor, you know, this, this smell. Yeah. Um, and I think it was something, uh, again, I want to say that I think it was a combination of people working closely together to determine this. And I think ultimately a guidance document has gone out that's will help many people in this area. Thank you for that response, Mr. Weldon. Regulations re require drug makers to submit field reports within three working days of receipt of information concerning any bacteriological contamination or any significant physical or other change or deterioration in its drug products. Yet, when McNeil began receiving consumer complaints in 2008, McNeil did not alert FDA further when McNeil had test results confirming the contamination. These results were not shared with FDA. Why didn't McNeil share this info with FDA as required? I, I cannot comment on that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I just can't comment. I'm not aware of that specific And Ms. Goggin, can you explain it? Sorry. Um, I don't know which um, incident you're referring to. Are you referring to the Bisapatia issue, sir, or what are you referring to? Well, okay. Here, your FDA regulations right. require. Right. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's go back to the first instance. Did you report it within three days? Well, to Mr. You, 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 you can twist my words if you like, uh, but you still can't get around the fact that you didn't follow the rules that you are, are required to. You can twist my words if you want, but why didn't you no. report it no, I'm sorry, within three days? I wasn't trying to twist your words, sir. I apologize. Okay. No. Well, do you understand the question I now? I do understand the question. Okay. I, and I don't, and to Mr. Weldon's point, um, we are aware of the regulations for the FDA, and you're absolutely right. We're supposed to report these within three days to the FDA. And you didn't. I don't know which incident you're talking about. If we did not, sir, we should Or any other incident. You didn't report it in a timely fashion within three days. Sir, if it, so, so, so why didn't you? Um, that I, that I question. Yes, that that I cannot answer. Um, I, I I would say though, in all instances, in some instances, I know that we did. I don't know the specific instance. If we did not, it was a mistake on our part, and we should have. You're absolutely correct. My time has expired. Hey, You're back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, uh, before we let you go. Uh, there are some terms, of actually phrases, that have been used. I want to make certain that the committee understands. Um, you used the term soft market withdrawal. What does that really mean, soft market withdrawal? Mr. Chairman, I have no idea what soft market uh, withdrawal is. I uh, have heard the term. It's used in the memos and the emails that we receive. I am I, I not familiar with the term. I do not know what it means. Ms. Goggins, do you know what it means? No, we don't use that term regularly, so I have not heard before this instance. You know, why would the employees use it? It's a, maybe it's the same thing as phantom recall. I, I'm just I, I, I'm trying to figure this out because, you know, you've seen it, you've heard it, you know, and uh, what do you think it means? I mean, I, we, we, we don't know. Yeah, I don't. I agree with you. I think the language is very unfortunate. It's terminology we don't use, and I also don't think it reflects accurately our um, our priorities, and the fact that we try to put safety of patients first. And I think that the use of language is unfortunate. Well, you want to comment, Mr. Weldon? Well, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, the the comment that I would make is that I think we've learned a lot of lessons uh, through this um, unfortunate situation. Um, I have said to you and to Mr. Issa and to the committee that we have learned and benefited by being here. I think that we have, we, could, we have discussed and can show you the changes we have made, the commitments we are making, um, the resources we are investing, um, the people we are putting into roles. I can only assure you that we will do everything in our power to never let this happen again. I think that the characterization of phantom soft, all kinds of things, I cannot explain to you. I wish I could, and I think many people use many different terms. What I can assure you is that we are committed 
to ensuring to resolve these problems, to fix these problems, and to make sure that we are giving the highest quality products to patients. As I said earlier, I think that, um, and, and I will tell you very honestly that the FDA and Johnson & Johnson, the people at McNeil have worked so closely together that we will be able to deliver some of these products in the market next week, and that is much faster than we ever thought we could have done. Our own internal expectation was that it would have been much later. Now, we are not able to fulfill the whole market, but I think because of the efforts that we have made collectively, we are going to be able to get these products back into the market for people that need them, and that is our single greatest concern. I can only commit to you we will do the best we possibly can, and we will do everything we can to ensure this never happens again. Mr. Weldon, let me thank you for Mr. coming Chairman. to testify, and of course, the uh, gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with the uh, unanimous consent of the committee, um, you know, I have a follow-up question to Ms. Goggins to try to square this testimony that she just gave based on committee documents that I have just received. Well, let me just say that um, uh, uh, before I recognize the uh, uh, ranking member, let me just say that I will give you two minutes to raise the issue and the question. I appreciate the indulgence of my uh, colleagues. Gentlemen, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as we go to the second panel, I would only ask, because of the gravity of this hearing of the failures uh, at J&J &J and the corrective action that we are expecting you to do, plus the likelihood that we are going to have follow-up questions for you in writing, if you would both do the fairly extraordinary thing of remaining here through the FDA testimony as principals, we do believe that what you are doing is essential. We are obviously interested enough, even after the House is adjourned, to hold this hearing, because this is important. The American people know we are getting it right. So I would only ask that you, follow, you do the follow-up written questions and, and, of course, yield back so the other gentleman can ask his. I thank you, gentlemen. Um, uh, and I also agree with the fact that really appreciate if you would stay and hear the testimony of FDA. Uh, gentleman from uh, Ohio. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The uh, committee uh, produced a document here to um, uh, Colin Goggins from, among others, Peter Luther and Bob Miller relating to uh, the final rem remediation plan uh, for the children's Tylenol. Now, on the document that I raised a question on, my last question, uh, I pointed out that uh, uh, Bob Miller and uh, Peter Luther were involved in a communication involving uh, Motrin. And for some reason, uh, Ms. Goggins, who was, in the, who was in the loop on the children's Tylenol, would leave this committee to believe that on something that apparently had wide circulation within her organization, she didn't know anything about it. Now, Mr. Chairman, one of two things happened here. Either Either she was out of the loop on that, and if she was, a pattern of concealment from her needs to be further investigated, or the other part is that, uh, Ms. Goggins, uh, you are not telling the truth. Now, would you like to respond to why you were kept in a loop on this, but you weren't kept in a, on, on the children's Tylenol issue, but you were, as you say, were kept out of the loop, or imply that you were kept out of the loop? on the, um, on the Motrin issue? What, could you square the discrepancy there? On, on your inner office communications? Yes, I will. Um, I was not um, in the loop, as you put it, on the uh, Motrin recall, but I was in the loop on the children's Tylenol recall. That Why? Is, that is because we received a 483 with a number of observations regarding the issue of the children's recall um, in June of that year. So it was brought to me. But my why? Opinion. I mean, did, did, aren't you, were you concerned about that after you found out? I was very concerned. Who kept you out of the loop? And why were they in a loop and you weren't? Because you are the head of the consumer products. The, uh, I was not in the loop, as I say, as you say, for the Motrin recall until, um, honest, until I was, came to the committee and then I went back and looked at the documents after my testimony. On the children's Tylenol recall, which happened in, uh, when we got received the FDA 483 in June of 2009, I was made aware of that. I was very displeased with that, and I maybe inserted myself in the loop, if you will. Th thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I am going to ask uh, you to direct staff to uh, call some of the people on this, uh, on this list who are involved in these communications, because we may find out something that might be a benefit to the work of this committee. Without objection, so ordered. 
Let me thank you, the two of you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Weldon, for uh, coming in your testimony. I want to thank you, Ms. Goggins, for coming back. I really want to uh, appreciate because, as you can see, that there is a concern here. And we also want to make certain that, you know, when medication is on the shelf, that it is safe. Uh, we, we have that obligation and responsibility. So thank you again for it. And we hope that you will remain and hear the testimony of FDA. Thank you for your testimony. We now will move to our second panel. <coughs> Dr. Joshua Sharfstein is the Principal Deputy Commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration. It is committee policy, Dr. Sharfstein, that uh, we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the whole truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Thank you. Let the record reflect that he answered it from you. You may be seated. Mr. Sharfstein, uh, uh, you have five minutes to deliver your uh, uh, testimony, and of course, um, which will allow the members an opportunity to raise questions with you. Uh, so you may proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the committee, I am Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would like to provide a brief update on FDA's investigation of the serious quality lapses at McNeil and then address the phantom recall. First, FDA has continued to investigate whether any serious illnesses or deaths have been linked to the recall. Since the last hearing, FDA has looked into adverse events reported to FDA and McNeil citing the products subject to the recalls. This investigation covers over 2,400 reports received by FDA for the two-year period preceding the recall, as well as for the two-month period immediately afterward. We did not, in this process, establish any direct link to a serious adverse event, including death and a recall product. Second, FDA has worked with McNeil to improve the two facilities at the center of the previous recalls. In Puerto Rico, as has been mentioned, FDA became aware that McNeil had received reports of products from its Las Piedras facility having a musty, moldy odor, and McNeil did not conduct a thorough, timely investigation of the issue or file timely reports. After FDA personnel urged McNeil to do more, the firm identified the cause of the odor to be a chemical called 246-tribromoanisole, or TBA, a pesticide used to treat wooden pallets. FDA issued McNeil a warning letter very quickly on January 15, 2010 related to this failure, and FDA since then has issued guidance and letters to industry. Subsequent investigations by customers have led to additional recalls, and McNeil has informed us that the fir firm has stopped using the wooden pallets, cleaned its facilities, and increased its oversight and qualification standards of its suppliers. FDA is currently conducting a follow-up inspection of the facility. In Pennsylvania, FDA found that the facility in Fort Washington had not conducted adequate investigations of product problems and complaints. During the April 2010 inspection, the firm announced it would stop manufacturing liquid products and conduct a major recall, as you know, because of excessive particulate matter, potency variability, and possible microbial contamination. Subsequently, the firm held a series of meetings with FDA and identified many corrective actions the company would take. 
These corrective actions include ceasing all manufacturing and renovation of the Fort uh, Washington facility, remediating the quality systems, and using a third-party expert consulting firm to review all aspects of the firm's manufacturing quality changes. We are continuing to review and provide feedback to the company. In addition, since the last hearing, third, all facilities associated with McNeil have been inspected at least once within the last year. FDA has found inspectional deficiencies of varying degrees of seriousness in all of these facilities. One common concern the agency has found is that the failure to investigate and correct product problems in a prompt and thorough manner. McNeil has responded to these observations with a large-scale corrective plan. FDA is currently reviewing and investigating this plan to ensure that corrective actions are actually effective. Fourth, FDA has continued discussions with Johnson & Johnson, the parent company of McNeil, to address the breakdowns in leadership and oversight that led to these serious compliance problems. We recognize the company is taking the agency concerns seriously and many changes have been made. We intend to keep a close eye on, on these facilities until the company earns our confidence back. In February 2010, FDA called an extraordinary meeting with the senior executives of Johnson & Johnson. At that meeting, the agency discussed a number of serious compliance problems at McNeil. More broadly, FDA confronted these executives about whether McNeil's corporate culture supported a robust quality system to ensure the purity, potency and safety of its products. As part of that meeting, the agency raised concerns about what has been called the phantom recall of subpotent Motrin tablets in the spring of 2009. FDA raised this concern because it seemed strange and concerning that the company had paid a contractor to go into retail stores across the country to purchase all available product while acting like a regular customer and not disclosing what was going on. In the summer of 2009, the agency told the company to register a real recall. Over the last several months, the committee has investigated this event further, using its authority to gather additional information from the company and the agency. Because of this committee's investigation, we understand much more about, what, about these events. My understanding comes from documents that have been provided to the committee by McNeil and FDA. I have not had access to all of the relevant materials gathered in the related criminal investigation. Based on what we know now, the phantom recall raises important questions for Johnson & Johnson, FDA and Congress. The current voluntary system of drug recalls depends on companies providing accurate and complete information to the agency and recalling adulterated or otherwise violated products in a prompt and appropriate manner. As you and other members of the committee have stated, the new documents raise serious questions about whether the company's actions have met this standard. But regardless of the behavior of a company, it is FDA's job to do everything possible to protect the public. It was clear in November 2008 that the Motrin lots did not meet specifications. Yet the actual recall did not happen until early August of the following year, and the notification in the FDA's recall bulletin did not happen until November of the following year. This took too long. Part of this delay can be attributed to several months spent checking whether or not any remaining product was on the shelves, and, in, and as a result, in part to less than forthright communication about how much would be on the shelves. Uh, the company was telling FDA there was nothing on the shelves. Their internal documents indicate they knew that there was product on the shelves. Then, in April 2009, the company sent a report to FDA indicating it was purchasing product from the shelves of retailers. This communication did not fully disclose the likely scale of the action or the way that the company was intending to proceed. In other words, it did not disclose the phantom part of the phantom recall. From this point, it took until July for FDA to tell the company that a recall should be conducted. In July, FDA um, not only uh, instructed the company that it should be registered as a recall, but then went on to confront the senior um, executives at Johnson & Johnson about what happened. In my opinion, however, the message that was delivered should have been delivered sooner by FDA. FDA has no legal authority to require a manufacturer to recall a drug product that is unsafe or is not in compliance with current good manufacturing practice. The recall system depends on full and open disclosure, trust, and the industry's acceptance of its responsibilities. FDA urges and expects firms to notify the agency when it is initiating a recall, but firms have no legal requirement to provide this type of notification. If a firm does initiate a drug recall, the agency does not have the authority to approve the manner in which the firm conducts the recall or to direct the firm to adopt a different recall strategy. Although the agency is able to accomplish most drug recalls with the cooperation of the manufacturer, there are instances in which firms are reluctant or unwilling to conduct a recall or to do so in a time frame that FDA believes is necessary and appropriate to protect public health. If a firm refuses to recall, FDA can pursue a remedy in Federal court like a seizure, but this can be time-consuming and cumbersome. 
Under current authorities, when the product has already been widely distributed to hundreds of retail stores, the agency would have to undertake hundreds of separate seizures in order to ensure that all viable product has been removed by the, from the market. The events Mr. The Chairman, could I ask unanimous consent that the entire statement be placed in the record so we get to Q&A? We have received it. Yeah. Without objection, your entire record, your entire statement will be included in the record. So if you just would summarize it so we can move Sure. I am sorry. I just have two more sentences. Sure. Um, the events of the phantom recall raises important questions about the current voluntary recall system. In this case, if FDA had the authority simply to order a recall to be done in the right way, I do not believe these events would have occurred. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I am ready for questions. Thank you very much. Let me thank you for your, your statement, uh, uh, Dr. Sharfstein. Uh, let me begin by asking, um, did the FDA approve Johnson & Johnson's phantom recall of Motrin? No. Um, to start, the FDA doesn't approve recalls. It is in the discretion of the company. But the second thing um, I think that is very important is the phantom part of the phantom recall. And this is, uh, was part of my testimony previously, relates to the fact that there were contractors going out telling people to act like res regular customers and not really tell the truth about what they are doing in the stores. And um, based on what I know, Based on the documents that I reviewed, I don't see any indication that FDA uh, was aware at the time that those types of activities were going on or approved. Right. Are you familiar with the soft market withdrawal term? I'm not familiar with that term. When Johnson and Johnson sent the FDA a letter, April 2009, talking about buying defective Motrin, why didn't the FDA become concerned and take action right away? I mean, what led to the delay? Well, I think that is a very fair question for the committee to ask. Um, that report disclosed that McNeil was retrieving product that failed specifications. Um, and re removing the product was the right thing for McNeil to be doing. But what it didn't say in that report was that they were, and you know, it, all it said was we were, we were going to retrieve it from the shelves or however they phrased it. It didn't say that they would be telling people to act like regular customers or not disclosing um, the facts when they were asked about what happened when they went out. Um, I think that uh, in part because there was limited information that might have contributed to the delay, but I also think that FDA should have been asking questions right away and figured out what it, the agency eventually figured out. Um, that this really did need to be registered as a real recall. What went wrong that caused Johnson and Johnson's recall of 135 million bottles of children's medicine? And is the FDA satisfied with what Johnson and Johnson is doing to solve the problem? Uh, are you satisfied with Johnson and Johnson? Sure. So what went wrong? There, there's sort of the um, notes and the music. You know, the notes are the specific details in the inspectional observations, the fact that uh, there were batches that were super potent or batches that may have had particles or an issue with how they investigated and responded to potential bacterial contamination. But the music is that the company had a, a, an inadequate quality system, and that you could see in multiple facilities. Um, FDA is both responding to the notes in the music. Uh, you can, you've heard from the testimony there are major changes at McNeil. FDA has been very involved in ensuring that those are the right kinds of changes. And uh, FDA is, is, you know, ex is committed to making sure when this facility is up and running that, that it is uh, in compliance. So you know, we are comfortable with where things are now. We appreciate the commitment of McNeil, uh, McNeil and Johnson & Johnson's leadership to fixing the problem, but this was a very serious problem and we are not going to take anything for granted. Right. Let me um, ask, does the FDA need more enforcement authority or funding to be able to respond to issues like the Johnson & Johnson recall? This bothers me in terms of for something like this to happen and uh, you know, we are concerned about safety. We can say, I mean, uh, does the FDA need additional authority? In um, other words, what is the problem? Right. Well, I think there, there are a couple things. This has to be put in the context that FDA did identify these lapses before there was a serious health consequence. We are not finding that there are you know, serious illnesses or deaths linked to this problem. 
um, and the agency, through its inspections and through multiple meetings with the company and aggressive, extraordinary meetings with the company, have brought, has brought about tremendous change in this area. Um, having said that, all of us want to prevent these things, and we want to be responding much faster in some cases than even what happened here. And I think that the issues of resources and authority are, are very fair questions. I testified that if FDA had had um, mandatory recall authority, I think things would have gone a lot different. Well, now how are you working with uh, Johnson & Johnson to correct this and to make certain it doesn't happen again? How are we working? Yes. Um, it is both at the individual facility level and at the corporate level. So we are helping them with the individual quality issues that they had as well as how they structure their quality program to make sure that um, the kinds of lapses that they had don't happen again. On that note, my time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California to rank no, no, no. you. Know, Please put Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, Chaffetz, okay. The gentleman from Utah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor, for being here. Um, Ms. Torres, can you help explain to me what, what is her current status? Is anything, has she been fired? Has she been demoted? Did she get promoted? What is her current status? Um, I understand she is still the district director in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And so you found that she has done nothing inappropriate? She acted just the way she should have? No. You feel I, totally I, comfortable with the way she acted? No, I would say that this is a matter that is under investigation. Um, you know, it is it, her, uh, we are looking at what happened here. As I testified, things should have happened sooner on FDA's part. That is something that we are looking at. And based on what we find and conclude, that could lead to, to different changes at FDA. Um, is, there, is there an opportunity for this committee to interact with her? Is there any reason we should, there is a hesitation on part of FDA to make her available for questioning by the committee? Well, as you know, I, I think that uh, the, I know at least the minority staff had requested to speak with her and FDA declined. FDA declined at the instruction of the Department of Justice because she is a, a witness, a central witness in a related criminal investigation. When you say related criminal investigation, does that related to Johnson & Johnson in this case or related to some other group or product? Or, no, I, I, I believe it is related to this. I believe it is related to this. R related to this. Um, is it your common practice or recommendation to not make field staff and people who are closest to these situations available to the committee? No, I, my view as former staff member of this committee right. is that, you know, that Congress should get as much information as possible. I think so is it your personal recommendation that she should be made available well, to this committee? But I also recognize the importance of the integrity in criminal investigation. Why, so would, why would a criminal investigation be slowed down by her appearing before this committee or even simply meeting with staff right. from both the Republican and Democratic sides of the aisle? Well, you know, I don't think that that is a judgment that FDA should make. And what we did is we turned to the Department of Justice and their career prosecutors and we, you know, we, we got instructions from them. And you know, they said that it basically that it would be a problem, and that's why. But I, I, I'm not even I'm not a lawyer. I don't know these cases, so I, I, I can't really comment. But but basically, we're relying on the Department of Justice. I, I think there is a frustration, if I can express it, at least from this member, that she should be made available. The other staff that should, that are there in the field office should be made available to in, in the spirit of full disclosure and what's happening. Um, I, I am a bit troubled by this Elaine, and a, again, I'm slaughtering people's names here, Elaine Bobo, is that how you pronounce her name? Uh -huh. uh, she is uh, the FDA spokesperson, and very recently she said it, it appeared in the Wall Street Journal and the Associated Press and Reuters, quote, any effort to suggest that, that the FDA had knowledge of the phantom recall is based on quoting documents selectively and out of context and ignores other evidence as to what occurred. McNeil's own written account of its communications with the FDA does not support the conclusion that McNeil disclosed the activities associated with its phantom recall to the FDA. Right. End quote. The, 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 I, have a, I have a problem believing that, and, I, and I'm troubled when the FDA puts out such uh, uh, a dramatic statement. And yet we got a whole host of information here that suggests otherwise. Uh, uh, well, if I could, I'd be happy to try to clarify sure. that and explain. What I believe people were alleging or there were questions coming to the agency was that we knew about the surreptitious, sur the surreptitious nature of the recall, the phantom part of the phantom recall, that people were out there telling, you know, acting like regular customers, not telling the truth when asked. And um, there isn't in anything that I've seen or anything before the committee evidence that FDA knew about that. Okay. And when you, when you, so I think that is what she was responding to. Now, uh, oh, go ahead. When, when we use the term recall, mm -hmm. that has some very specific 
um, implications. I mean, it, it is a term, right? It's not, it is a very specific term that has a great deal of definition to it in the world of the FDA and certainly the, the, the companies that you interact with. So if a company came and said, we're conducting a recall, you would have a pretty good sense of what they're going to do, right? I mean, am I off base in saying that? Um, not all recalls are the same. They then have to file a form which goes through all the specifics. Okay, and so there can when be a fair amount of variability in a recall. So I'm looking at this, ND, this uh, field action report, which is dated mm -hmm. uh, April 21st of 2009. And, and mm -hmm. part of what was submitted said, the product from the subject lots found in the stores was removed during the visits. Visits to the remaining retailers will be completed by July 15, 2009 to remove any product from the subject lot that is found. Correct. They didn't say they were doing a recall. They said they were going back and getting the, and look, I'm not trying to excuse their action. We just heard no, testimony from them saying we, we didn't do this right. Right. And, and I, want to, I want to be clear. FDA was informed of exactly that in April 21st. Then, and how does but the FDA spokesperson not, come out and say we didn't know anything about this? I, I think the difference is what she was referring to is that we, what, she, what she's saying FDA didn't know and I still don't see any evidence of is didn't know about the surreptitious lying part of the recall. That it, wasn't, it wasn't a recall. That's I guess well, the of the events. Okay, and and that and that that is still not in the documents where people are being instructed to say things that we aren't. We all agree, true. but what the what so my concern is, and I would. And that's not in that document. What what I would appreciate you looking back and considering right. is that the FDA statement was very strong, saying, "Oh no, you cannot construe." There was evidence that you should have looked deeper into that. When they say they're not doing a recall then I think the FDA has some obligation to probe a little bit further, maybe ask a few questions. And you admitted that they came to the party late in this, in this regard. Let me read a couple quick quotes, because mm -hmm. I, I cited them earlier. This is from internal J&J &J, um, uh, documents. Quote, FDA is really bending the rules in this case because of the fact that we stopped distribution a while ago. How do you... I mean, so for the FDA I, to go take a real strong stance and saying, oh, we knew nothing about this, but then mm -hmm. we have documents back from March 24th of 2009 saying the FDA is really bending the rules. Here, here's what I can explain I think that one means, because I'm familiar with that. That was a referring to the fact that we weren't ordering a recall without even the check, that is my understanding of that document. And that, the, that, that when he says because we just, but basically a product that is violative and on the market should be recalled. But the company came to us and said, we don't think any is out there. But they said that to us, even though their own documents here indicate, I believe, that they knew that there was some out there. But they said very specifically, and in fact, if you look at the March 23rd FAR, they were saying, there's none out there, there's none out there. They used that argument, and FDA's uh, district office said, well, if there's none out there, you don't need to do a recall. He interpreted that as bending the rules, but in fact, I, our I regulations have... permit uh, there's none out there not to have a recall. Mr. Chairman, let me just make this, this last comment and I will, I will yield back. I think it is irresponsible for the FDA to put out a public statement when the documentation shows that it wasn't a quote unquote recall, that there is a criminal investigation in place, that there are internal documents that demonstrate there were many discussions with the FDA. I think you had plenty of reasons to not attack the committee for the testimony that we were able to draw out during the previous testimony, but you essentially came out just a couple, literally days ago, mm -hmm. and attacked the credibility of what this committee is trying to do, and inf really what we're trying to do is inform the public and let them help, you know, participate in this and come to their own conclusion. There was plenty of evidence from multiple sources that did not warrant the strong statement that came from the FDA. That's part of my point. I'd appreciate your consideration looking at that moving forward. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for his um, questioning. Uh, now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much. I, I just, I think, first of all, I want to thank the gentleman who just asked questions. I thought he asked a great set of questions, and as I was looking at the document that he was referring to, Dr. Sharpstein, there is a sentence here uh, that said the assessment reform demonstrated that on a statistical basis a low amount uh, approximately 1 percent of the, of the batch, batches is potentially still at the retail level. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Now, what did that say to you all? I mean, so you didn't think it was that much out there? Uh, that's correct. And in fact, if the, the month before, in the um, March uh, version of the same document, it actually said 
it is expected that none of the affected lots are available at the store level. And, so, and, and at the same time, there, is a, you know, there are several documents that have emerged through the committee's investigation that they were um, expecting to find more. And in fact, they found more. And I'll, I'll read you one of the emails that was on April 16th prior to the submission of that. And it said, we found 264 units of the impacted lots which would project there is potentially 5,280 units across the 5,000 stores, or 6.3 percent of the total product manufactured and shipped. Now, which goes on to say why she thinks. And this, uh, but but this was not information that you all had at the time. As far as I can see in the documents, this information was not shared with the FDA. Now, you know, Dr. Sharpstein buried in the field alert report dated April 21, 2009. There's a brief statement that, and I quote, the product from the subject lots found in stores was removed during the visits. How would the FDA normally interpret a statement like that? And how would most companies normally right. remove product from stores if they were conducting a product recall? And how would the FDA and general public be informed? Right. Uh, well, I think that is an excellent question. I, I spoke last night to the head of enforcement and the um, Office of Regulatory Affairs and FDA, and he said that he had looked at that report and that line, and he said it was an unremarkable line, that that is the kind of thing that companies do as part of recalls. They go out and they get the product. But when what is remarkable is the phantom part, that they were concealing it when they went out, and that is not in there. And he said that is remarkable. What is in the report is not remarkable. And so, you, so let me make sure I'm, I know what you are talking about. As you heard, McNeil instructed their contractor Inmar to, 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 quote, simply act like a, quote, regular customer, unquote, while making these purchases, uh, they are also told, and quote, there must be no mention of this being a recall of the product. So when you say you didn't know the, about the phantom part, that is what you mean. That is that exactly what you, right. Mm -hmm. I see. So just for clarification, then, you thought they, there was, apparently there is a situation where they, something was not dissolving properly, and no one was under the impression, that is, FDA, was that it could be harmful to somebody would, that would buy it. Is that, is that a fair statement? Um, not pose a safety problem, but it wouldn't necessarily be as effective as it should be. Say that again? It, it, we didn't think that it caused a safety problem, but right. we agreed that it might not be as effective. I see. Uh, as it should be because it was less medicine in the pill, basically. Now, did you all do, I mean, did you all know they were going into 40 states um, to do this phantom recall? All we knew, I, I, you know, I don't know if I can answer that completely other than to point to that document. That is what we were told, that they were going to retrieve it. Uh -huh. um, and, but I think that what is clear, and this is where I, I believe that FDA could have done better, is that document does not say a whole lot. And we should have been asking questions then to really understand more. We eventually did ask those questions. We eventually did find out about the phantom part of the well, phantom recall. And, the, and, that's and then we called, you know, the agency called the company to account for it, and that's why we are here. Now, right. Dr. Sharfstein, um, let me ask you this. You, so you are adm admitting that the FDA did not do all it, was, it should have done. Is that right? That's correct. And, but we don't take, want to take light off of the fact that McNeil and J&J and &J could have done better, too. Is that right? Well, I think fundamentally the responsibility is with the company to, do, to, um, to uh, have handled their quality problems in a much different way. But as Mr. And FDA did respond and did identify these problems. I think we always have to ask ourselves whether we could have done so fast. And that leads me to my final question. Um, how do we know that we now have an FDA and the department that deals with this that would deal with it differently and would deal with it in a way that would, would uh, cause that trust to come to citizens of our, our country who might be buying the product? Um, that is a fair question. I think I would point in part to all the work that we have done with these companies since this came to light. Um, and I would also say that uh, Dr. Hamburg, the Commissioner, and I are absolutely committed to strengthening the enforcement and the oversight of FDA. I've actually invited here today our new head of enforcement, uh, D Dara Corrigan, a former acting HHS inspector general. This is her first week on the job, and I asked her to come to, to make to, you know to understand the uh, what had gone on in this case and the need, as she uh, 
works and establishes leadership over the, this part of FDA, um, the need to, for us to do everything we can. Could she raise her hand so we'll at least know who you are talking about?